Our next speaker is uh, certainly a friend that you not only recognize by his name, you recognize his face. He's familiar to all of us at Farm Bureau, and that's former Speaker of the House of North Carolina House of Representative Harold Brubaker. Harold Brubaker served in the North Carolina House of Representatives for 35 years, including two terms as a Speaker of the House from 1985 to 1998. Many of you remember that we're at a Farm Bureau convention in 2012. We presented uh, Speaker Brubaker our Distinguished Service Award. He was a strong friend in the legislature on a host of important issues that impact all of you and your farming operations. Since retiring in 2012, Speaker Brubaker has continued to work closely with Farm Bureau and with our legislative team down at the General Assembly as I said, on a, on a host of issues. Most importantly, though, uh, Harold Brubaker is a Farm Bureau member. He and his son, Jonathan, work a cattle operation on about 180 acres in Randolph County. They have about 70 Angus and American Belgian Blues cows. And from what I can understand from some folks have told me, Mr. Speaker, you're probably one of the largest breeders of Belgian Blues on the East Coast. We've asked uh, Speaker Brubaker this afternoon to share some of his thoughts as a legislator and now as a lobbyist about effective legislative strategies, some that you can use, some that you can take back home. He knows us. Harold Brubaker knows us. He knows what we stand for. He's worked with us for years, even, even in times when he's disagreed with us. He's always been our friend. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Speaker Harold Brubaker. Mr. Brubaker. Thank you, Larry. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. I didn't know I was speaking to the Baptist Convention. Everybody is sitting in the back. <laughs> now, you know, the church that I attend in Randolph County, where's Jimmy and where's my brother in Randolph County, Richard, Jimmy, and Ken, uh, is a uh, friend's church. And one of the uh, older gentlemen in the church told me years ago, uh, we got talking about uh, Randolph County, and he said, you know, the bootleggers used to come into Back Creek Friends and sit on the back row. I said, oh, so then why is it filled up today? He says, I don't know unless they're descendants of it. But he said, you know, the offering plate always got the fullest on the back row where the bootleggers were. Well, so I'm a little concerned about everybody sitting on the back row here. Well, thanks for having me here today. I feel at home, uh, having grown up on a dairy and poultry farm. And how many dairy farmers we have left in the room here today? Well, we got one, two, three, four. In 1955, there was an article in Horge Dairyman. You remember the Horge Dairyman magazine? And it was a little, little cliche, a little saying, that little poem that said, I long for a cow of modern make that will milk five days for leisure's sake, sleep on Saturday, snore on Sunday, and start fresh again on Monday. Have you ever developed those cows? <laughs> well, it might be coming. Well, again, I'm delighted to be here, and thank you, Larry, for having me, and Peter, and Julian, and uh, where's, uh, where's everybody else at? I guess they're outside. But... Uh, it's been quite a challenge after serving a number of years in the House of Representatives, representing Randolph County for 35 and a half years, and, and then as, uh, as they, my friends on the lobbying side say, now you've come over to the dark side. But I want to talk to you a little bit today about how to get to know your legislator and what influenced me the most when I was a seated member of the House of Representatives. The first and foremost issue is that you need to know your legislator personally. Now let me ask a question, and don't be embarrassed if, if, you don't, if you can't put your hand up. How many of you in this room today have the cell phone number of your legislators on your cell phone? Raise your hand. That is fantastic. Now we need to encourage the rest of you to do the same to make sure that you can pick up the cell phone. If you can call, when I ask, when I ask folks, how well do you know your legislator? Oh, I know him very well. Well, could you pick up the phone and call him Sunday night after church, 9 o'clock, 9.30, and get him on the phone, and he'll talk to you? If the answer is yes, 
then you're tight with your legislator. It's called a grassroots effort. And I know that's what Farm Bureau is working on now with all of you as leaders from, from the, every county in the state here today. Because when we look at agriculture across North Carolina, as probably as you heard from the previous speakers today, you have a shrinking area. When I first went to Raleigh in 1976, 77, the first session, the majority of the members from across the state were agriculture, in agricultural communities, and a lot of farmers. When I think back in 1977, back in Randolph County, uh, when uh, in 1976 we had a dairy farmer, Bill Farlow, chairman of the Randolph County Commissioners. We had Floyd Langley, farmer from over in Staley and the Randolph County Commissioners. We had uh, Sonny Davis as the chairman of the Board of Education. We haven't had a, anybody in agriculture as a chairman of the commissioners or as chairman of the Board of Education in 25, 30 years in Randolph County. And it's important that we're involved and it's important that you get involved in your local community to have a voice. The best way to contact the legislator is the grassroots. And those of you in here that already know your legislators and, and, and have their fast dial to phone on your their, their cell phone number on you, that's a great start. You can have the best people in the world, which we do at Farm Bureau, representing us here in Raleigh. But nobody, nobody can pass an issue if they don't have the grassroots. So whether it's uh, Jake, the Jake's in the back of the room, or if it's Peter, or Larry, or Julian, coming in to talk to me as a legislator, that's fine. But if a, somebody back home picks up the phone and calls me and talks to me about an issue, oh, that's a voter. That's a voter that can talk to somebody else. You know, whether it's Peter, Julian, Jake, or the president of the Farm Bureau, they don't live in Randolph County. They didn't live in my district. They couldn't vote for me. But if my local president, if Richard picked up the phone, or his wife Fadeen picked up the phone, or Ken or Jimmy picked up the phone and called me, which they did, that was very important. Because that's hearing from an individual, from a member. I always hated emails as a member. Because I would get five and six hundred a day at times. And you physically cannot go through all those emails and try to read them. Plus the fact you'd have somebody that would send you an email. They might decide to send it to you at 12.30 at night or 1 o'clock in the morning because they're mad about something. And they hadn't thought through the issue. Whereas the person that takes the time to pick up the telephone and talk to that member on a one-on-one -on -one basis as a friend and can talk about the issue, that's more important. If you, don't, if you can't pick up the phone and call them, if you write a letter... Now, this might sound kind of old-fashioned, but it's still in effect today for all the members. Because very few of the members will receive a letter in the mail anymore. It's all email. You know? Who were the guys that said uh, you're supposed to save trees? Well, my cows like trees. It's shade. The important fact is that handwritten letter. Not that professionally typed letter on real pretty stationery. That you, that you had to go and get very expensively printed up, but that handwritten note. How many people take the time to do that today? And as I presently talk to members of the House and Senate, any time a letter or a note comes in handwritten, bingo. That's the first piece of paper at their desk. That's the first thing they're going to read. So if you can't pick up the phone to call that legislator, write them a note. Write them a little a short note, a letter. Because think about it. It really don't take a lot of intelligence to sit down at a computer and type out an email address and send something off. It takes a little more of an effort to pull out a pen and start writing because, see, when you're doing that email, if you misspell something, you can do a spell check. You can back it up. Some of the best letters I ever had were misspelled words. I knew it came from the heart. Their mind was thinking. They were writing fast to try to give me their message. But it was important. That person had to take the time to write that note. A phone call is the best. A written letter is second. Of course, texting is, uh, is a new fad today. Texting is, is a, when I was a member, I liked texting. 
uh, just kind of started when I was uh, about finishing up there. And now, now today I love texting. You know, it's always neat to text someone, hey, Ken, when you have time, can you give me a call? You know, something like that. Uh, because you never know when you're trying to call someone, if they're involved in the middle of a meeting or something else, but they can always text you back. So learn to text. That's important. To text to them, say, I need to talk to him and get a second. Uh, a text that I received today from uh, my congressman, Richard Hudson. He's been to the Ashburn Farm Bureau. Uh, Richard knows that I'm personally interested in Section 179. Everybody know what I'm talking about? Section 179, the IRS rules and regulations. Uh, uh, so the congressman, now the Clear Blue, texted me today and he said, uh, The House is going to pass a permanent resolution to Section 179. Well, I appreciated that. You don't have to send me a letter, a long email, just a short text, brief. And that's important for you of how you would reach your legislators and reach, reach the members of the House and the Senate. It's very important. Now, especially as we look at the new demographics in the state shifting, when you shift from rural to urbanite, those areas, and you have more and more legislators coming from the suburban areas throughout North Carolina, as compared to the rural areas of North Carolina. So you see this shifting of demographics. And so it's important of how some folks communicate. And they communicate a little differently than in the rural area. You know, where as the crow flies, how many have heard that saying before? As the crow flies, you might be five miles from the house. It might take you 20 miles to get there, but you're only, by the way, the crow flies five miles from the house. And so it's important as, as, as we see these dynamics changing in politics in North Carolina that we make sure that we have that interrelationship with the legislators. Because in our industry of agriculture, there are more things done in Raleigh that affect our livelihood, our neighbor's livelihood, than frankly in Washington, D.C. Need I say LA 200 regulations back in the mid-90s? Whoever, as the old fellow would have said, whoever would have thunk about that? You know, they're changing. And so you have your urbanites that might think different about rules and regulations. And uh, how many of you ever heard of the Rules Review Commission in North Carolina? That was, uh, yeah, you're married to one of them. <laughs> that, was, uh, that was set up, that was one of the things we did back in 95, 96 where we have a commission set up to review all the rules and regulations that are passed. Now, and, and Fadine Whitaker is appointed to that uh, uh, review board right now. One of the most important committees in North Carolina. What they're supposed to do on there is say, what's the economic impact? So if you pass this rule regulation department A, B, or C, what's the impact in North Carolina? How is it going to affect agriculture, if you will, or how is it going to affect all other facets of business? Is it an economic generator or a cost factor? That's the things that they're supposed to take a look at. So besides uh, EPA, the Rules Review Commission, is, in my books, is a very, very important commission. Now we had some folks a couple years ago want to do away with it. And the only way we got that passed in 1995-96, in Peter and Larry, was what we had to attach it. It was an 80-page bill. We had to attach it to the budget bill. And all my good friends over in the Senate pitched a fit. Senator Bass and I, he didn't like it. But I told him, it's the only way I could get him to talk about it. And uh, rules review came along, and it's been very important to North Carolina. So when you're looking at, at the importance of grassroots, and the importance of what you do here at Farm Bureau, think about this. So whether it's uh, the president of your organization or the other folks that are downtown, uh, Peter, Julia, Jake, that are walking those halls, it's important that they have backup. And so when they stop into an office to see a member about a particular issue, whether it's auto rates, which I'm working with them in that particular issue, uh, that... The backup comes from back home. Because when we walk in that office, we're not a voter, but when you call, that's very important. And that's the important part that I want you to be thinking about today. That you should know your legislators individually. Be polite, be nice, you all know that. Your mothers and fathers taught you all how to do that when you, grew, when you were growing up. 
but it's extremely important to be brief when you talk to your legislator. Uh, I used to get a little perturbed when someone, my secretary, would come in and say, so-and-so wants to come in and want to block out an hour. Well, what do they have to talk to me about an hour for? You know, Be brief, 10 to 15 minutes. Never hand out anything that's, that's longer than a one-pager. Oh, I had people walk in with books and everything else and here, we want you to read this. Yeah, right, when am I going to get time to do this? You know, I'd put them on a snack, and I had good intentions. I thought the rainy day or slow day, I'd start reading that stuff. Nine months later, that snack was up to here. And then we're out of session. Well, what am I going to do? I've got to clean my desk off so it goes in the wastebasket. But that one pager that someone handed me, I had time to read it. And that's what's so important. So you have your facts, very short, brief to the point. Don't waste a lot of your legislator's time. And of course, by having a personal relationship and a very close friendship with them, that's extraordinarily important. And that's what it's going to boil down to. Let me give you an example. So last session, there was an, there was an issue dealing with uh, uh, insurance companies paying for eyeglasses. Now, first of all, let's stop and think about that for a second. Since when's an insurance company going to pay for eyeglasses? It's the policyholder that's going to pay for them, or the business guy that's paying for the policy. Insurance companies don't pay nothing. They're pro pro providing the service of collecting it. So the mandate was coming down that, that uh, they did not have to give discounts to eyeglasses. So if you were, if you were a member of Company X, and you went to see your optometrist, ophthalmologist, and he prescribed a pair of glasses for you, because you were a subscriber to this company, you would get, you would get a 30, 40% discount. And the bill said to do away with that discount. Didn't have to give you that discount, okay? Now, what happened? So in the insurance industry, in trying to talk to members, and the insurance industry did not have grassroots, but the optometrist did. And every optometrist in the state got on the phone to their legislator. That thing slid through there like a freight train because of the grassroots. Because you see, the doctor calling understood what that meant to his business. I mean, how many of your business would like a 30, 40% increase if you'd have to give a discount? They understood that they understood what it was about and they called their legislator to get their support to get them on board. And that thing just flew right through the House, flew right through the Senate, and became law. It's because of the grassroots that they were successful. And it's because of what you can do as members of Farm Bureau back in your communities by knowing your legislators, being able to pick up the phone and call them and talk to them. That's what's important. And then, whether, whether it's uh, Larry, Peter, Julian, Jake, going in to see that member, they can say, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, Jimmy, Richard, Ken, they called me. Yeah, they called me this week. They told me that uh, this is a very important issue for Farm Bureau, and I just want to let you know what I think about it and why I think it's very important. It's that personal relationship that counts. For example, if you have someone, and I had them come in, didn't know him from, here's an old saying from Adam's house cat. I never figured where that came from. But uh, never, never saw him before in my life. All of a sudden, hey, how you doing, Michael? Great to see you. You know, I sure, I sure, I should have got to know you a lot, lot better a long time ago. But here's what I need. And Michael's there. Well, what I want to talk to this guy for. I've never seen him before in my life. And all of a sudden, he's going to be my best friend. It's, it's a Johnny come lately. Have you heard that one? Johnny come lately. So don't be a Johnny come lately. Be there on the spot. Know your issue. Be brief with your issues when you talk to your legislators. Be able to call them on the cell phone. Be able to text them. And my test to you, if you can take out your cell phone, call your legislator Sunday night at 930 and get them to pick up the phone, then you've arrived you have that close relationship with your legislator. Now, don't, don't go back home and start doing that this weekend. And the word gets out, uh, you know, then I'll be, I'll be mud downtown in General Assembly. But that's what the important issues are of how you, 
how you lobby, if you will, because that's what you are. We're all lobbying for, for Farm Bureau and for agriculture in the state of North Carolina. And our voice is important in agriculture. One of, the, one of the biggest industries. I was delighted. I don't know, Mr. President, if you had a phone call yet, but you probably, I suspect you probably will be getting a phone call from the North Carolina Chamber. They're talking about having an agricultural area in there and uh, picking up to be able to, to uh, point out the influence of agriculture in North Carolina. And so that's a step in the right direction, in my opinion, because we need all the voices we can have to sustain, to sustain the momentum if you think about the economy in North Carolina, and if you think about the engine of agriculture, you know, it used to be that we'd say that selling houses, home builders, was the engine of the economy for the state and nation. Uh-uh. We know what happened when we had the downfall. And we would have had a more of a, a tremendous economic downfall if we would not have had agriculture. Agriculture is the engine that drives the economy of this state and this nation. Don't ever forget that. All of us in agriculture should be extremely proud of what we do in agriculture and what we do for the people of North Carolina. So never be, never, never be ashamed of what you're doing or what you're representing. Be proud, step up to the plate, and hit the ball out of the park. Thank you.